I think we would all agree there are some lessons that we learn rather quickly. These lessons stick with us. We never have to be reminded. For example, a little kid touches a hot stove. And typically, he, the lesson is learned and he never touches that hot stove again. Or maybe a husband, a husband makes a comment about his wife's weight. He does it once, and if he survives it, he never does it again. Of course, there are a few exceptions to the rule. Some guys just like to ask for trouble. Or maybe an employee openly criticizes the boss in front of the boss and his coworkers. And that employee may never do it again at that place of work because he doesn't work there anymore. Learning can be costly. The, the pain of our mistakes helps us learn very quickly. But there's other lessons that maybe take just a little bit more time. But once we learn that lesson, it becomes part of our everyday life. I have to admit, I had a mom help me with these and some of the other ones. The first one is remembering to say, I love you. This is one we've added to our family. And, and I would add while saying, sometimes we say love you, and that's great. I like to make it more personable and vulnerable by saying, I love you. Or saying, please and thank you. My mama taught me that one, and I've learned it. Or texting good morning and good night to family members who don't live with you. It's a, it's a fun and easy way to let someone know that you care for them. And this is one for the guys. This is a lesson some of us guys maybe learned and we've forgotten or maybe we've never been taught that, but that is to open the door for the girl that's with you, whether it's your date, your wife, your mom, your daughter, or your granddaughter. And I know there's some teens up in the choir loft, and I'm just going to say to you guys, guys, do this. It shows your respect. It shows your caring. And girls... You can do what my wife said she used to do when she was dating. You go and you stand by the door, and you wait. You wait for the guys to open it. Because you know what, girls, ladies? You're worth it. But then there's still some other lessons that are so hard to put into practice. Some of these lessons are taught, and it seems like 10 minutes later, they are forgotten. Here are some of the, those difficult lessons for our kids, our, our grandkids to learn. And, and we just hope that one day, all of our screaming will have been worth it. Wake up! Why does it take me telling you ten times to get up? Get up the first time I ask you. Great lesson. And that's naturally followed by the lesson of get ready. You're going to be late for school. You're going to be late for church. Or this is a great one that I always had trouble with. Clean your room. I always tell the story with my mom that I, was, I wasn't really messy, but I would take off clothes and they would just pile on the floor. I knew where they were. Well, my mom figured, okay, what she will do is she'll take those clothes that are piled on the floor and put them back on my bed so that I can't get back in my bed that night. But me being really smart, you just shovel them back to the floor and you go back to bed. Don't leave dirty dishes in the sink. My son Adam, when he was away at school, lived in a, a house with a bunch of guys. One of the guys never did his dirty dishes. And so one of the other guys got that great idea and got a tray, a cafeteria tray, and loaded all this guy's dirty dishes on it and put it right in the middle of his unmade. He learned to do his dishes. Take out the trash. Be respectful. Don't wait to the last minute to do your homework. Don't pull your sister's hair. That was a favorite pastime of mine. Close the refrigerator door. Don't slam the door to your room. Now, wouldn't it be great as a parent or maybe as a wife talking to her husband or vice versa that if you didn't have to constantly try to teach these lessons? But then you know what? Sometimes we wouldn't have anything to talk about. The Bible also teaches some of the same lessons, some of the same truths over and over again. I guess we're slow learners. You know, for example, pastors sometimes repeat themselves. Did you know the Bible teaches the same lessons over and over again? I guess we're slow learners. 
I do repeat myself, and sometimes that's actually intentional. Because I think the Bible does this, and pastors, we do this, because like little children being reminded to clean their room, we all, every single one of us, need to be reminded of the Bible's truths. It's how we learn. It's how our faith grows. And Paul faced a similar issue with the church at Corinth. Just prior to our reading in 1 Corinthians today, Paul had just finished writing to the church about order and worship. You see, some in the church there took extra pride in their spiritual gifts, those gifts that God had given them. Their use of these gifts wasn't lifting up the church or God. They were doing it for their own glorification, for their own edification, and so Paul called them out. They should have known better. Earlier in his letter, Paul dealt with other issues concerning the Corinthians' pride. See, they were so impressed with the things of the world that they sometimes seemed to forget the gospel. They pursued status. They admired power. And this is a lesson that as we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, or the letter of 1 Corinthians, that Paul's taught over and over again. Paul also taught them about love. And today, in the first verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul went back to what I would call the basics of the gospel. The Corinthians had heard this message many, many times, but Paul knew that it needed to be taught again. And Paul not only shared the basics, he went a step further and then demonstrated how the gospel is to transform us. And so this morning, we're going back to the basics. For those who like to go deep and uncover great theological truths, well, I'll tell you something. You can't get much deeper than the basics. The gospel is life-changing. If you consider the basics, that message never grows old. Now, before we get into what Paul had to specifically say about the basics in our passage, there are a couple other very basic things that we should cover this morning. The first one is that the gospel declares that Jesus, as God, Jesus as God, became a man. He was born of the Virgin Mary. In Matthew 1.20, an angel of the Lord said to Joseph, that which was conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. And the math doesn't work, but Jesus is 100% God, and he's 100% man. And then in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, it states, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. God became a man in Jesus. Hebrews 2, 16 through 18 says, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way. It's talking about Jesus. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted tempted. See, because Jesus became one of us, he's able to take our place. And so the basic fact here is that Jesus came to earth as God incarnate, God in the flesh. And then the second basic fact of this that hits before Paul starts his lesson is that Jesus lived as one of us. And even non-Christians, even people that have no belief in Jesus at all, believe that he walked this earth as a human being. But it goes further than that. Jesus faced the same temptations that we face. He got hungry. He got tired. He had to eat. But unlike us, Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life. 1 Peter 2.22 says he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Being sin-free was necessary to pay for our sins. See, Jesus did what you and I couldn't do or can't do. He lived a perfectly sinless life. A life of perfect obedience to God. And now the next gospel basic is where Paul steps in with our passage this morning. And the first one is kind of obvious. Jesus died. That's a fact, isn't it? Everyone dies, but if you think about it, Jesus' death was different. In 1 Corinthians 15.3 from our reading, Paul wrote this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also see, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. In Romans 3, verses 23 to 25, it says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. 
Yet God in his grace makes us freely right in his sight. He did this through Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God, Paul says, when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. He died for our sins. And then Jesus was buried. Paul wrote, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried. Because Jesus really died, it makes sense that he was really buried. But some people will say that Jesus simply passed out on the cross and that he never really did die. And they say that's why he sit, he, because he didn't die, that he could walk out of the tomb because he never was dead. And it's a nice story, but it's not true. Think about this. How could a man that was severely beaten roll back a huge stone to get out of a tomb? How could that same man then convince his followers that he came back from the dead when he was barely alive? Most of the disciples die for their faith. And it's true that people will die for a lie, but they die for a lie because they believe it is true. People don't die for something that they know is a lie. And if that's not convincing enough, remember, Jesus was beaten severely before he was put on the cross. And, and historians will tell us that it wasn't that unusual for a person to actually die from the beating before they were crucified on the cross. And then hanging on a cross itself is a terrible way to die. You suffocate. We're told the Roman guard pierced his side. The Romans were masters at crucifixion. If the Romans determined Jesus was dead, he was dead. And then third, the most important is that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul wrote, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he goes on and he says, and that he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Jesus was put in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It was guarded by the Romans. If those guards had let somebody steal Jesus' body out, it was going to cost them their life. The disciples didn't steal his body. That wasn't going to happen. Think about this, too. The first ones to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning were women. Now, back then, if the disciples were making up this story, they would have had themselves or some other man go to the tomb. A woman's testimony, sorry ladies, but a woman's testimony was worthless those days. Jesus appeared to a whole bunch of people. Peter, the rest of the disciples, and 500 brothers were told. And Paul said those 500 included many who were still alive at the time his letter was written. What he was saying there, there's plenty of eyewitnesses to either verify Jesus' resurrection or deny it. Jesus physically rose from the dead. Pastor Timothy Keller said it this way, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept everything that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything that he said? Paul says the same thing in the verses right after our passage. He wrote, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still stuck in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished. If in Christ... We have hope for this life only. We are the most people of all to be pitied. What he was saying here is if Jesus didn't ri rise from the dead, you know what, we might as well all go home this morning. But he did. Jesus did rise from the dead. And that changes everything. And that truth is to lead to gospel transformation. Jesus Resurrection means that your life and my life should be radically changed. And one of the problems, I think, today with Christians in America is that we look like everybody else. We don't look different. And if that's you or if that's me, I think we need to ask God 
to help us change. We need to examine our life. Because the fact is, is that we should look different. Our priorities are to be different. We have joy in us, and joy doesn't mean that we're always happy. But joy does mean that we have hope. Because of Christ, we worry less. We have a brighter outlook on life. We are to be known for our compassion. We stand on the truth of the Bible, and we do it in love and compassion. And what that means, all that means is that you and I have a new identity. Paul had a new identity. The once proud persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ proclaimed, last of all, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared also to me, for I'm the least of all the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So there's a thought for you. If you know somebody that you think is a lost cause, they're so far from God that they can never be changed, all you got to do is look at Paul. He wanted to kill Christians. And then he became one of the greatest Christians to ever live. And then Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And when Paul wrote, I am what I am, he's saying that I'm a new person and I'm good with it. Wrote to the church at Galatia, he said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. To the Corinthians, in his second letter, he wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, as I look around this room, a lot of you have been in this church for a long, long time. And you've heard about how we're new creations. And when we hear that, sometimes it's like, yeah, fine, we're new creations. We need to realize the significance of being a new creation in Christ. We're a new people. We have a new lease on life. We don't have to give in to the sins of our past. We can change. God will change us if we're willing. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and so the question comes to that you've got to ask is, so what does that mean in pact- practical terms? What does that mean when I walk out of church today? Well, I'm going to tell you it means everything. I'm going to give you just a few examples. You know what? If you're typically a crabby, angry person, being a new creation in Christ means you don't have to stay that way. Joy can replace your anger. If you think the goal in life is to have lots of stuff, you can become less materialistic. You'll appreciate the things that God has blessed you with and enjoy them, but you're not going to hold on to them too tightly. You'll give cheerfully of all that God has given you, and if you think about it, everything we have has been given to us by God. If you're harsh with your spouse, your kids, or anyone who rubs you the wrong way, God can change you. It takes time, but you can learn to appreciate those very imperfect people God put in your life because we realize that we're all imperfect people. If you're view the world as as a half-empty cup, you can accept that, yeah, you know what? Life is hard. It's not easy. But Jesus has promised to never leave us and to bring us to paradise with him one day. And we remember that every morning we get up that his mercies are new. Every day, every new day is an opportunity to live in a different manner. If, if you're proud and want people to be impressed with you, you can learn that being proud and impressing people, you know what, it's really not worth your time. God will put new desires on your heart. And guess what? They might not be easy, but they're going to be worth it. You can humbly by used by, be used by God to make a different difference in people's life. You'll truly leave a legacy. And if you're coasting through life, God can give you new meaning and purpose. We are to be ambassadors for Christ, sharing the joy and the truth of Jesus with everyone we meet. 
And you know what the best part of, thing is, of that whole list, all those things that can change in us and that can happen, is that we don't have to do it in our own strength. In fact, if we try and do it in our own strength, I can tell you what's going to happen. We're going to fail. If we do it in Christ's strength, the change might not happen overnight. We still fall back into our old ways, but gradually, over time, we'll become new people. God will give us the strength. Paul's last words in our passage today, and if you listen to him, they might sound a little bit like he's boasting, but they're really not. He said, his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. But then he adds, he goes, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Paul worked harder than any of them. It was a fact. I mean, all you got to do is look at his writings and his travels to see proof. Paul was relentless in his mission for the cause of Christ. You know, you can imagine Paul talking to people about his faith and about Jesus till late in the evening. And then he'd go to sleep and he'd wake up a few hours later and he'd remember that he forgot to tell them something. And he'd get up and he'd write it down. And, and then in the morning he'd jump out of bed because he couldn't wait to begin a new day of sharing the love of Jesus Christ with other people. And, and maybe you know somebody like that. I happen to know a few. These people are passionate. When they get an idea, it consumes them. If they face opposition, they see it as a challenge, and you know what they say? Challenge accepted. They won't back down, and they keep working or speaking and coming at you to convince you of their point until, you know what, you say to them, enough, I get it, I see what you're saying. If you'll just leave me alone, I'll try your idea, or in, I'll, I'll look to see what you're saying, what this truth is you're saying, if, if it really is true. When such people are working for the cause of Christ, watch out. They're like Paul, but you know what? They are unstoppable. But they also realize what Paul realized. Paul worked hard, but he knew, you know what? It wasn't him. It wasn't all about him. It was the grace of God that was working in him and through him. The grace that he had received in Christ gave Paul strength. And that grace changed Paul. And it gave him the strength to change the world. And God can do amazing things through you and through me as well. This past week in the Lunch Bunch, we were all challenged by a great video message from Pastor Craig Goshell. And Craig asked a couple questions that I want to ask you. What breaks your heart? What makes you righteously angry? And basically what he was asking was, what burden has God put on your heart? It's, it's one thing to understand the gospel basics, or even to know the deepest theological truths of the Bible, but it's something entirely different to take the gospel out to the street. You know, as a pastor, I'll take ten people with a simple, basic understanding of the gospel, but are who are ready to make a difference. I'll take those ten people over a hundred people who maybe have great theological understanding, but they never put it into practice. When God calls you, when God puts a burden on your heart, Pastor Craig Rochelle says, let it ruin you. In other words, let it consume you. Let it drive you to action. And then act. God wants us to understand what we believe and why we believe it. But if that doesn't change the way we live, something is wrong. We are new creations in Christ. We were created and empowered by God to change the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Sometimes we look at the Bible and we look at it and we think it's so hard, it's so challenging, I can't understand it. Other times we look at the Bible or we hear a message and it's like, I, I've heard that message before. I've heard it so many times and we, we kind of wander off and we start thinking about what we're doing this afternoon because this is all old stuff. Father, when that happens to us, and I think it happens to every one of us, we just pray that you would knock us upside the head. The basic, simple truths of the Bible are so profound. What you have given us in your word is life-changing. It changed the world 2,000 years ago, and it has the power to do it today. But I think sometimes, God, that as Christians, we get comfortable. We like what we like. We like our life. We're not willing to have our life ruined, to have a burden put on our heart that consumes us. Open our hearts. Open our eyes. You've called each of us to do something. Maybe it's simply to pass on the faith to our children or our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren. Maybe it's to minister to the homeless. Maybe it's to go overseas. It could be to just be in our neighborhood, to be active and be that light on our street. God, you know our hearts. You've given us gifts and abilities that we can change the world. And Father, when we think about that, we always do think of action and doing something, but one of the greatest acts we can do is pray. If we can do nothing else, we can pray. And as you know, Father, we've been praying for five families for the past few weeks, and so I would just pray that this week we remember. We remember to pray for people. People we know, people we don't know. Pray that they would be part of the five that would be impacted by the ministry of this church. And so, Father, we come to you on our knees knowing that we're not worthy, but Jesus Christ is worthy. And we pray the words commonly called the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Great, will please stand and comes up to lead us in our closing song.